Welcome to an Oral History of the Church. I'm Adam Crispin. And I'm Jonathan McCormack. An Oral History of the Church is a conversational church history podcast coming from a Christian historiographic perspective, discussing subjects by volume or season. On this podcast, we consider history an art form. Let's get into it. For those of you who missed last week or want a quick refresher, last week we talked about the three canons of historiography, or three objectives, or three tools. Uh, these are the, the things that historians use to paint a picture of um, a historical event. Uh, criticism, which is analysis um, of a source. It doesn't mean being negative. It just means questioning and analyzing and verifying right. the sources that you're working with. Right. right. Um, Doing the hard work rather than just taking it as it says without thinking exactly. through it. Exactly. It it actually does take some work to understand what the source is actually saying. Yeah. Uh, the second is analogy. Uh, you have to figure out how to communicate it clearly to your audience. Mm -hmm. uh, this can be a cultural barrier between uh, the your reader and the historical event. Or if you're writing for a specific age group, if you're writing history for kids, you have to figure out how to say it in language they can understand. Right. And correlation, uh, you have to figure out what were the causes of the events. Uh, mm -hmm. Who are the players? What are the physical causes? Were there social or economic factors? All these kind of things. You have to figure out what the cause of these events was. Right. And um, this time around, we're going to talk about what are primary sources and secondary sources. Um, if you're, if you're going to write a paper that's at all related to history or really any kind of paper, uh, we'll use primary and secondary sources, although we will focus mostly on uh, history as it relates to primary and secondary sources. Um, that's what we're talking about today. So these are these are documents that you'll find in your professor's syllabus <laughs> requiring <laughs> you to produce a paper using, you know, However many primary sources, you know, minimum, uh, things of this nature. So let's, Jonathan, let's get into what are primary sources. Primary sources are records from the time period you're studying. Uh, so it can be government records like mm -hmm. a birth certificate or mm -hmm. census records or uh, church baptismal documents. Mm -hmm. uh, or it can be diary records or um, letters or uh, formal treatises. Mm -hmm. Something by the people that you're studying. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So... With primary sources, we find it to be first-hand accounts one way or another. Something from, as you said, something from that period in time. Now, generally, as, um, as historians, our primary sources are text-based. But from time to time, you'll find things like um, murals, uh, different art items, or even buildings can be a form of a primary source. Right, right, exactly, depending on what you're working with. So if we're trying to determine baptism practices in um, early Christian North Africa, uh, it tells us something if there's a little 
small fountain next to the uh, the pulpit, mm-hmm. or if there's a big trench uh, that's big enough for an adult to walk down into um, at the front of the church building. Uh, that right. tells right. us they either practiced believers' uh, baptism by immersion, uh, or they practiced uh, some sort of non-immersion practice. Right, exactly. Or if you're looking at church uh, buildings or church grounds where uh, meeting halls were located, and you have uh, church building after church building after church building attached to or including a graveyard for several centuries or more uh, as, as a trend... Why does that matter? Why, you know, you can understand that as a primary source for this is something that they thought was important to do. And now I need to dig into the why, as opposed to nowadays where many new churches, if not almost all new churches, uh, have nothing to do with graveyards. Yep. So your text primary sources influence how you understand your physical Um, primary sources, but your physical uh, sources also influence how you understand the written text. Right. Right. And something I think we'll we'll discuss uh, really the whole episode long is that your sources inform and um, explain one another as you go. So... um, your primary, you will go back and forth between your primary sources in order to understand each of them better, and you will also especially do that between primary sources and secondary sources. This is a good segue into what is a good secondary source. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> well, secondary sources are really almost any document that comes from a uh, any later period in time than that which you're studying. So if you want to understand the Renaissance, you read books and letters and whatever else from the Renaissance period as primary sources. And then, let's say during the, I don't know, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century on, you read a history book here or a biography there. These would be secondary sources commenting on anal- having analyzed primary sources from that period. Yeah, so this can be a history textbook. This can be um, a biography on the person you're studying. Mm-hmm. Um, or sometimes there are really narrow um historical monographs that will analyze trends Mm -hmm. so uh someone that we'll come back to in a moment was curious about justification and tracked how people talked about justification in church history Mm -hmm. from the close of the new testament up to uh the beginning of the modern era Mm -hmm. uh uh, Mm -hmm. alistair mcgrath's uh uh, Hustia Dei, uh, Justice of God. Um, mm-hmm. He he tracked the history of the doctrine of justification. Uh, there are other such historical accounts that might track a trend or an idea mm-hmm. instead of a person or a movement. Right. And they're all secondary sources. Yeah. And so there's there's some significant differences between the two. Some people might not care. Uh, what's the difference? If it talks about that period, it talks about that period. Uh, while I can kind of sympathize with that, there, there are some significant differences between the two. Uh, and also some nuance that makes them not so different. Some sources, some documents can be both, depending on what passage you're reading or well let's let's get into that Jonathan what's what would you say is the first major difference between a primary source and a secondary source 
the first major difference is the nature of the document. Um, a secondary source almost always intends to be a secondary source looking back in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, a primary source is, is going to be timely. Mm -hmm. uh, the document's going to be looking at the current events. Uh, right. So to speak. Uh, you might have discussion of other historical events as a tangent in mm -hmm. your your journal, but nobody's writing in their journal about uh, how awesome uh, an event was 200 years ago. They're, <laughs> they're talking about current events. Right, right, exactly. Although if you did come across that, that would be a spot where a primary source becomes... A secondary source, since it's commenting on something from history prior prior to the uh, the life of the the one writing that journal. Exactly, and so that does lead us to the second major difference, and that is use. Um, why are you the researcher? reading this document are mm -hmm. you reading the document to understand some sort of event that the document is talking about or an event contemporary to the document mm -hmm. this this has a bit of nuance but let's give you an example um there is a very wide community of um, scholars into John Calvin. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a rather important Christian figure, whether you agree with his theology or not. Right. Um, Karl Barth, a uh, reasonably significant uh, Christian theologian of the, the 20th century, mm -hmm. wrote a very important work on the life of John, life and thought of John Calvin. If I am trying to study John Calvin and I pick up Bart's book, uh, then I'm reading it as a secondary source. Mm-hmm. But let's say I'm trying to write a, a book on or a paper on Bart's understanding of predestination, and I'm reading his discussion of Calvin on predestination. Mm -hmm. It's not, it becomes a primary source at that moment instead of a secondary source, because I'm reading it not to understand the life of Calvin, but to understand the life of Bart. Right. So that particular example, are you using it to understand the person who wrote it or the one about whom it is written? <laughs> There's a, a statement credited to Bart. Uh, you can't do theology in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a funny picture of uh, Karl Bart stuck inside of a vacuum cleaner. Uh, <laughs> The, the same is true with us as historians. Uh, historians don't do history in a vacuum. Right. We write history with an ethical aim or as commentary in part on our time. Mm -hmm. uh, we think there's something to learn from whatever we're, whatever happened in the past mm -hmm. uh, to help address something today. Right. And even down in the nuts and bolts of doing history writing, if we go back to the the three canons that we discussed, if if you don't use the tool of correlation to understand what led up to the moment or movement or life of the person or whatever it is that you're studying, you're not going to truly do a good job trying to understand that. So there's also that just kind of nitty-gritty side of um, 
the inability to do history in a vacuum. Exactly. We run into these problems in um, biblical studies as well. Um, if you want to try to understand the life of, let's just say, oh, I don't know, Jesus of Nazareth, <laughs> <laughs> the the Gospels are our primary sources of that information. So how you how you approach the Gospels will matter. Do you approach them as primary sources as they purport themselves to be? Uh, that is a kind of biography of this Jesus written by eyewitnesses or an acquaintance of an eyewitness, if we're talking about um, uh, either Luke's gospel or Mark's gospel. Are we treating it like a primary source in that sense? Or do we treat them as a secondary source where um, we understand, no, 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 these are written much, much later. These have to be written in the second century at the earliest. Um, or these have to be written in uh, at the end of the first century at the earliest. Um, if we treat them like that, then we'll, we'll have a much different approach to how we read them, how we use them, how we understand them. Uh, Which is, is... Go ahead. And that's why criticism is an important component of uh, doing history. Right. We have to be aware of how we are reading the document and assumptions we make about um, the, the documents we're reading. If we make assumptions that are faulty about the uh, the Gospels, we're going to come away with a faulty understanding of what happened in the uh, the life of Jesus. That's right. I keep working with the, the same example. And we can't know if we're doing that if we neglect to ask those questions. So if I neglect to ask what assumptions I'm coming at the scriptures with, then how can I be confident that I'm, I'm giving it my best, that I'm understanding it to the best of my abilities for what it is? So for Jonathan and I, we approach the scriptures with a uh, hermeneutic of trust. We talked about that in previous episodes of this volume. We approach the scriptures as honest attempts to describe and transcribe the interaction of God with man. And in the specific case of the Gospels, Jonathan and I treat them as earnest and honest attempts to recount the life and um, teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. And so we, we are aware of that as we approach the biblical texts and uh, try to do our best by them. We don't let that, as we've discussed in previous episodes, we don't let that be either a, uh, a hindrance in being afraid to try and understand it in in a way that comes by uh, our hermeneutic, and at the same time not uh, an unquestioning uh, assumption where we we don't do the hard work at all. Exactly. Uh, if we're if we're not critically examining the biblical text. We're not examining our assumptions about the text. It's not that we're distrusting the biblical text. It's that we want to make sure that we are we believe what the Bible says about itself. Right. And to that end, sources don't tell us everything we would want to know. Sources can yeah. omit information. And sometimes there's a reason they omit information. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. There, there have been times where I'm, I'm reading certain uh, primary sources. I want to continue with the biblical examples, if you don't mind. Uh, go for it. Such as in the, uh, the epistles of the New Testament, and they mention this detail, or they critique that practice. And I sit here and go, all right, well, I have no idea what they're talking about. 
Now I need to dig around <laughs> and try to understand why it matters that women don't speak in worship, according to Paul. Is that right? Am I understanding that right? Or uh, who is this person that they're referring to, and why does that person matter? Um, so sometimes sources... Well, not sometimes. All sources omit something. They can't tell everything. That's right. Now, some sources will also give intentionally false information. Right. We don't believe that the Bible does that. But when we're doing history, we have to acknowledge that not everyone we're working with may be playing um, a fair game. Right. Can we I... shouldn't... Go ahead. Go for it. I was going to ask, do you mind if I invoke Godwin's Law real quick? Sure. First of all, you're Hitler. No, you're not Hitler. But <laughs> if you wanted to understand the... Uh, if you're if you're trying to successfully implement the tool of correlation on World War II, and all you read was Mein Kampf and uh, transcriptions or translations of Adolf Hitler's speeches, you would come at the understanding an understanding of World War II very differently from the vast majority of the world who have taken the time to uh, engage other primary sources, including, of course, film and uh, the documentary newsreel films of the era. I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean fictional movies like Saving Private Ryan. I mean the newsreels of the journalists that went to Europe, uh, the, the photographs the army and so on took when they um, liberated concentration camps and so on um so if if all you read was the a one particular voice you will only understand that moment in history or that movement or that person whatever it is that's at the heart of your subject matter from that one angle and that source it all as we said all sources omit something Many but of them a... omit with particular ends in mind. Go ahead. Exactly. The If we understand why they omit this event, mm -hmm. or why, in cases of uh, a dishonest source, why the information is wrong, it can give us a better understanding of of the event or the person, things like that. Uh, say a guy who lies about his age, um, making him older in mm -hmm. World War II era so that he can actually go out and enlist. Right. It's a, a different person than someone who doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so th this is why we have to read why this is why professors require so many primary sources and of course uh secondary sources in support of those. It's so that you you will read from and engage with multiple voices on the same subject matter in order to best understand that subject matter. If you just grab one and you're done you will not have a very good grasp of it i have taught um uh quite a few classes now in new testament studies and every time i required a paper i required a certain amount of sources i required a couple of commentaries and uh, uh, uh which are if you're not familiar with biblical studies, although I can't imagine any of our listeners who have no idea what they are. Uh, biblical commentaries, these are books that comment on a particular book of the Bible. Um, so I require at least a couple of those and um, a, a couple of other kinds of sources, uh, which became very difficult in the 
original setting where I started teaching in San Quentin State Prison. It's not exactly an extensive library there. That's neither here nor there. The point is, every time I required multiple sources, and every semester there was at least one student who would turn in a term paper that used one source. One source. Those were consistently the worst papers. Consistently. Because they did not get their hands on every angle of their subject matter. Their, they did not get to begin to really understand their subject matter. So this is why we have to engage with so many primary sources and, of course, secondary sources. And this is why we go back and forth uh, having the documents interact with each other. So I will read this this diary over here, and then I will go back to my uh, history book on that uh, movement and say, okay, now how, how do I understand that fitting in with what this person is saying? And then I go over here and I read census documents to try and better understand a comment that was made in the secondary source and then i go back to the secondary source and then i go to yet another primary source and so on this all may seem quite complicated but let me summarize sort of what's happening when you're doing history you're having a conversation you yeah. are trying to communicate to a new audience what has been said in the past you're trying to communicate it in a specific elegant helpful way but your goal is to help people hear from these voices that they might not have heard and if you're not listening to a wide variety of voices you can't tell who's really the important people to listen to. That's right. Speaking of important people to listen to, <laughs> uh, we we do think that it is uh, worthwhile to give you some book recommendations. Uh, and we've got a couple. Yeah, so uh, my suggestion for you is a pair of books from Alistair McGrath. Uh McGrath wrote, uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably already know who this is and what book this is. But in case you don't, Alistair McGrath wrote a book called uh, Christian Theology. It's a theology textbook. It's a big tome that covers the, the basic categories of theology in depth. And um, it, it does a very good job. I like that book very much. It has a companion book called The Christian Theology Reader which correlates with the chapters and the and the, the readings are uh, in the uh, Christian Theology Reader, those readings are either short documents that can fit in what he's trying to do, or they are excerpts from larger texts that connect with the, the doctrines that he discusses in the first book I mentioned. So McGrath's Christian th Theology is very good, and the Christian Theology Reader is, I would say, a good place to start for reading primary sources. Where Christian Theology is a secondary source, the Christian Theology Reader is a collection of primary sources where you can engage or begin to engage with all different kinds of texts from all different eras on all the major doctrines of the Christian Church. In the same uh, vein, uh, we'd like to recommend some uh, books that are related more to ch church history. Uh, Christian theology is the history of the church, but uh, there is more to it than that. Uh, one book that is a uh, a very good reader, again, another set of excerpts or small documents, uh, Documents of the Christian Church by Henry Bettinson mm -hmm. and Chris Maunder. Uh, nice, good uh, 
thesis sections of larger documents Mm -hmm. or complete smaller texts that that point out the the places of conflict through church history that's a very good little book uh i also want to recommend that for sure it's it's about the the thickness of a novel but it's it's rich sources of theology from the history of the christian faith um i i enjoyed this book so much i actually read it without being required to a couple of times uh there were two separate years uh separated by two or three years i forget where i actually used it um in conjunction with my devotional reading yeah it's it's not dry yeah. at least if you're paying attention to what you're reading <laughs> there's the things that will really be helpful for your understanding of uh god and of uh his people Another book, um, sort of parallel to McGrath again, uh, is uh, Leon Macbeth's A Source Book for Baptist Heritage. Uh, this is, a, again, a, an anthology of uh, secondary sources. I mean, an anthology of primary sources for right. Baptist history, mm-hmm. uh, predominantly focused on uh, English speaking Baptists, uh, but it's got uh, letters and sermon pieces and uh, denominational minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it shows a pretty wide variety of kinds of historical documents and it supplements his. Uh, Baptist heritage, um, a, an almost encyclopedic volume on uh, Baptist history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very good. And I, I've used some of Macbeth's other stuff as well. In fact, uh, I have a, an odd little anecdote I want to I want to jump in here with real quick about primary sources. I think it was through. A footnote from an article by Macbeth where I read a primary source from the 19th century in America, the United States. There was a a local church that um, exercised church discipline on one of their members. And this guy did not like that. So uh, the next Sunday, when everybody came to the church building, the meeting hall, they discovered that it had been burned to the ground. And that's in church minutes. That's in a, <laughs> that's in actually associational minutes. Uh, so um, if you if you think some of those weird mentions that uh, Jonathan and I have have made so far can get boring. Uh, They've also got some pretty interesting little stories in them, too. <laughs> also, we don't condone, condone the burning down of the church building as a settling of uh, personal <laughs> disputes. <laughs> yes, or at least not in most cases. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that's that's about all we've got then, Johnny Mac, isn't that right? Well, we don't want to neglect plugging our next episode. That's true. In our next episode, Volume 2, Episode 5, we will discuss tertiary sources. Uh, These are going to be a different kind of source than what we've discussed as primary and secondary, um, but something that is very important when it comes to understanding how to begin reading these primary and secondary sources. Right. And that one comes out two weeks from today on December 30th. It will be the final episode of our podcast for the year 2016 for what I think are pretty obvious reasons. Do you have any, (laughs) do you have any questions for us? Uh, We are 
we have opened up an email address, and we are happy to uh, start responding to questions here on our podcast. Anything you have about the subject matter we're tackling now, or any other uh, historical kind of question you may have? If so, hit us up at churchhistorypodcast at gmail.com. So that's all one word. There's no underscore, no hyphens, nothing like that. It's just Church History Podcast at gmail.com. Let us know. Also, uh, we have uh, finally launched our n- new companion podcast. Uh, last episode for this show, we hadn't uh, put it out quite yet, but uh, it launched on uh, December 5th. Uh, so every Monday, you can get your hands on a new episode of the show that we've called Saints Gone Before. It's like uh, 10 to 20 minute bursts of uh, audiobooks. So that podcast features purely without any, no commentary episodes, no discussion episodes like 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 our normal podcast, this one you're listening to. This new podcast, Saints Gone Before, is uh, purely a, a way of putting out primary sources. So if you're interested in maybe getting your 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 brain around some more primary sources from the history of the Christian church, you can subscribe to Saints Gone Before to do so. We think primary source material is very important for our understanding of history. I think it enriches uh, the discussion that we have in uh, this podcast. And the first two episodes we have... Uh, feature the Didache. Mm -hmm. Uh, Adam, do you want to talk a little bit about what the Didache is? Sure. It's uh, an early Christian text from probably the second, possibly the third century uh, AD or CE, depending on how you were taught to think about history. Um, It's it's like a church manual. So if if you're a church out in Nowheresville, North Africa, and you want to know, okay, how do I do... Like, I know baptism is important, and, um, you know, we've had these visiting teachers come and, and preach to us, uh, w- but how am I supposed to, how are we supposed to do this? How do we conduct ourselves? This is a text that circulated among the churches in those those early centuries, but was not recognized as, uh, while it was recognized as a good document, it was not recognized as of the same uh quality uh and I don't mean that in uh good or bad but in uh substance and source and all of that uh as the New Testament. So it was not included in the New Testament, although some wondered whether it should get put in there. Uh it it talks about all those kinds of questions. It also has a lot of um ethical teaching about like personal ethical teaching, uh, repeating little bits of uh, the Sermon on the Mount here or something from the Gospel of Luke there. Um, so it's it's an interesting kind of mixture of teachings on personal ethics or on how the church is to conduct itself. If you want to listen to the Didache, episodes one and two of Saints Gone Before cover the whole thing and they're out now so if you just search for saints gone before on itunes podbean player fm uh uh, what are the other ones blueberry and uh google play and really any other podcast app that um aggregates from though any one of those you can get your hands on saints gone before and the first two episodes cover the first and second halves of the didache so it's it's out there, ready to listen to right now. Uh, you may need to put up with some of the uh, 19th century uh, <laughs> biblical translation habits of thee and thou and stuff like that. But um, that's... But it's an en- Go ahead. It's an engaging document, and it's worth uh, your time. So I hope you give that a, a quick check out. That's right. I thought it was pretty interesting. That's why I suggested it to Jonathan as our, our first pick. So there it is. Anything else we want to cover with our, our listeners? 
I don't think so. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, recording our next one. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, as I learned how to write papers and do research, I got pretty excited about the role of tertiary sources in research and writing. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. I think we're going to have a good time, and I hope our listeners will as well. All right. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. Yeah.